Alright, the last thing we'd like to look at at our cinematic level examination is editing. And the short definition is basically the methods by which a director moves from one shot to another. You know, think back to those early examples of film that we saw where basically the filmmakers would set up their camera, film for minutes, seconds, whatever, until they were bored, then hit stop and go, there, we're done. You know, we've seen a lot of evolution from then in that uh, we have multiple cameras going on, we have multiple storylines going on, we have things shot out of order, you know, the ability and the technology to go from, you know, long shots to close-ups in order to make story more interesting and to make stories uh, deeper, more complicated, uh, and more easily followed by uh, the audience. And so editing takes a huge role in terms of making movies movies rather than stage productions. You know, because live theater is live theater. Whatever happens, happens. You can't go back and correct that or change that. You know, the show must go on. But editing is what really seps separates movies from everything else and from real life. You know, the fact that you can go back and correct things, do it again, see it from a different angle. Uh, so I think editing is, is really important to that cinematic level and uh, makes movies truly movies. And so the two schools of thought on editing, um, you know, there's probably more than that, but the two that we're going to look at here, uh, number one would be the idea of classical or continuity editing, and then the other is a more modern look at editing. Uh, sometimes people call it, you know, MTV style editing. Um, it's what you guys are most familiar with since you've grown up in that generation. The idea of fast cuts, you know, things blazing on screen, you know, nanoseconds on screen, but we're able to figure out what they mean. So let's go ahead and take a look at uh, each of these in turn. First off, continuity editing, you know, often called classical editing. Uh, basically, the idea is to link scenes together seamlessly so that the action seems to continue. So perhaps we have a shot from behind somebody as they you know, put their hand on a doorknob and then the next shot is from the other side of the door as the person walks in and then the camera follows that person for a while walking over toward a desk maybe in a pan something like that and then we're gonna go ahead and cut to what that person's looking at um, in a close-up or something like that so the whole motion is pretty smooth. You know, it makes sense. Person walks in, crosses the room, talks to somebody else. There's no guesswork as to what's going on. We can follow the action. Um, there's also kind of an understood grammar in this style of editing that we need to build context first. And so most often you're going to see some sort of long shot establishing where this action is taking place. And then the next shot would probably be a medium shot you know, a little bit more context. Okay, here's the person or the people that we're going to be, you know, dealing with. And then eventually you would move to a close-up shot. And that seems to be kind of the way um, that the historical filmmakers use their grammar to make things understandable to the audience, moving from bigger to smaller. If we look at that second idea of more modern editing, we get a couple um, different examples here. One is the idea of a montage or basically collision editing. You know, they're not trying to keep things smooth and in a linear fashion. Basically just taking a bunch of images, jamming them together, and saying, hey, you the audience figure it out. Which is interesting because our brain will naturally try and make connections between images. And so if you happen to have a, a moment, watch the podcast we've made on montage in specific, and you'll see a great example of the, called the Kuleshov effect, where basically a guy took a bunch of, of images, put them back to back to back, and let the audience kind of you know, figure out their own emotions and response to this. And the short of it is the images of the actor were um, alternated between you know, an empty soup bowl, uh, a, ca a casket with a young child in it, that kind of thing. And the audience was like, oh my god, that, the, that actor is brilliant. He's so amazing. When in fact the images of the actor were the same thing just used three times. And so the audience's brains were trying to make connections there and going, oh, look, he's so sad when he sees the empty, you know, sees the casket. And he's so hungry when he sees the soup bowl, that kind of stuff. When in reality, 
you know, the same actor's face was shown three different times. But we have a lot of examples of montage where they're just throwing together a bunch of shots without any spectacular, you know, devices to use between them, and our brain is forced to figure out some meaning from this. Another example you might see in modern editing is the idea of jump cuts. And basically what this is, is, is instead of having smooth action, you know, somebody walking in through the door and following them across the room, um, the filmmakers and the editors are, are violating certain rules in terms of camera placement. And so um, it seems like the action is jumpy, literally jumpy. You know, like it looks like somebody's kind of twitching or frantically searching for something. Um, and so they're violating what we call the 30 degree rule, which is that some cameras need to be placed about 30 degrees away from each other so that when they do cut to the other, the other image captured by another camera, it does seem smooth and natural. And by violating that quote unquote rule, the action on film seems to jump. And so it becomes a little bit more hectic and scattered. And so we tend to see those in some more modern movies, but they don't have to be modern in terms of date. They could be more in terms of modern in terms of style. Then the last thing I would throw out there in terms of editing is kind of this idea of MTV style editing. And I don't know what its exact, you know, definition is, but basically MTV, you know, kind of made its money on music videos and just a lot of quick edits, you know, um, shot lengths came way down. Things were very quick, cut to cut to cut to cut, you know, as opposed to some of these older movies that had very long average shot lengths. You know, they're, they were in the, you know, tens of seconds, 20 seconds, things like that. And through MTV, the shot length came way down, you know, one second on screen, half a second on screen, things like that. And so things seem a lot faster, a lot more cuts, a lot more shots per movie. And so you can definitely feel a difference. You know, if you're watching something that is classical continuity, it seems very smooth and lyrical. Uh, and then you contrast it with something that's more modern, you're going to see a lot more jumping, um, a lot more quick cuts, things like that. So just to look at some of the, the tools that are used during editing uh, to transition. Some of these are, you know, more outdated than others. Some of these bring with them a certain grammar, but we just wanted to talk about some of these. Uh, the first one is the idea of a fade, and this is basically where the image on screen is going to fade to black or to white, and then a new image is going to uh, take the place of that on screen. And so we're always looking to move to that interpretive level, and so the question becomes, well, what does that mean? You know, we kind of get this, that basically a fade means that time has passed. And oftentimes filmmakers will, on the other end of a fade, be helpful and telling you, like in a text track, they'll say something like, you know, 10 years later or 50 years later. Or maybe they're using it as a flashback type thing, five years earlier, so that they can, you know, show that time has passed. We don't need to watch a five-year-long movie. Not possible. No one's going to watch it. No one cares. So how can they compress time? One common way is with that fade. Another way is with the dissolve, and this is basically where an image on screen starts to fade out, but before it's completely gone, we get a fade in of some new image. Now it's a, it's a slow transition, it's not natural, it's not how we see our world, like I don't get to fade out and fade back in somewhere, you know, I just look around or turn my head or blink, that kind of stuff. Um, but as we move to that interpretive level, the point is that those two scenes are somehow connected. You know, that we are to interpret that whatever was on screen before and that we're seeing now after the dissolve are in some way connected. And that's our job as film goers to figure out why are they connected or how are they connected. The cross-cut editing style, you know, this is uh, also called parallel editing. You know, the idea of cutting from one scene immediately to another. You know, you're looking uh, and on screen we see a, a train barreling down the tracks. The next scene has been cut to uh, of a person you know, whose eyes are wide with shock, cut back to the train, cut back to the person. You know, we can tell that these two images are related, and we can also tell just from that interpretive level that these things are happening at the same time. You know, we don't really need to go, well, why is there a train? And 
why is this guy looking shocked? You know, what's going on to him? Or what's going on with that guy? Like the grammar and our experience with movies has told us that, um, you know, the train's coming down the track. This guy thinks he's going to get run over, that kind of stuff. And so, you know, the amount of times they cut back and forth and the speed at which they cut back and forth can help create suspense for the audience. You know, will the person uh, get away from whatever's chasing them? Will the two things collide and somebody gets hurt? That kind of stuff. Um, so a little bit more natural speed, I guess. You know, like every time you blink could be seen as like a cross cut. You're seeing new stuff. The last one we'd want to look at is what we call an eye line match, uh, kind of a point of view shot. It's almost like the camera is looking out of the eyes of one of the characters, and so the camera is seeing exactly what they are seeing. And so it feels different. Um, you know, it's probably done with a more handheld camera, so maybe a little bit shakier, but then that's how we see our world. You know, we're moving, we're fidgeting, we're changing direction, we're crossing our legs or uncrossing or doing whatever, standing up. And so our world isn't smooth. And so having this ability to make an eyeline match where the camera sees what the character sees may change the feel of that movie. And so here we'll show you an example from Philadelphia. You know, there are some special edits that, um, you know, basically just more ways that we are able to connect scenes together. And some of them are underused, in my opinion. Some of them are overused. And many of them are more outdated. You're only going to see uh, some of these in very specific cases. And so here, the first example we'll show you is from the movie Chicago. And this is where we have what's called a push. And this is where you know an image is on screen. And the new image that's coming in to replace that is literally pushing it off screen. So you can see at some point both parts completely and fully in focus on the screen. So it's not a dissolve where it's kind of fading out, fading in. It's literally taking one image and shoving it off screen. And again, kind of slow, kind of unnatural, but just another way to transition. And then the last one we'd show you is an example of an iris where you know, this, this was much more prevalent in kind of that silent era where they wanted to transition and they would literally like close the, the lens cap. What does that mean? Why would they choose that here? Why are they using the unusual iris all of a sudden? You know, in the example I'll show it comes from The Departed where 99% of the stuff in there is, uh, is cross-cutting. Super quick cuts between action, very modern feel, very quick cutting. But then every once in a while you get these really slow, seemingly antiquated iris cuts. You know, why would they do that? You know, A, we gotta identify that it is an iris. And then B, what's the interpretive effect? What are they going for here? And so that's it. We have finally reached the end of our look at the cinematic level in many a part. Uh, hopefully you have a better grasp on what that cinematic level actually means. And again, those are the things that make film uniquely film, you know, not live stage and definitely not literature. So we are moving into the more technical and cinematic level of film. As always, if you have any questions or concerns, please let me know and we'll go from there. Thanks a lot for watching and have a good one.